Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I wanna cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize. And we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today, and we want to keep that good feeling going, so let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content, and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the actual tech media webinar series. Now you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device. And as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide. And there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already. And I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. All right, yeah, let's get started with this actual Tech Media EcoCast. Our topic today is a great one, integrating edge computing into your architecture. And I want to start by saying a big thank you for joining us. On the EcoCast today, we've got some of the most innovative leading companies in the industry. You're going to be hearing from experts at Scale Computing and at Rubrik. We've got a lot of uh, innovative solutions and hot trends and creative strategies here today. Um, and to guide you through some of those, you're going to uh, you hear from some of the moderators. You already heard from Jess. Um, I am Scott Becker. And uh, we've also got our senior moderator, David Davis, uh, on hand for some of the Q&A. And he'll also be part of a, a fun keynote that I'm going to tell you about in a minute. Now, as always, it's not just awesome content that we're giving away. We also have fantastic prizes. And today we've got three Amazon gift cards worth $300 each. So we'll announce those after some of the sessions here today. Now we're going to get started with a keynote that will be pretty fun. We've got David Davis and actually another ATM moderator who I didn't introduce previously, uh, Keith Ward. So they're going to walk us through some dumb questions about edge computing. So I'm going to turn things over to Keith to get us rolling on this EcoCast. Hi, thanks so much, Scott. So joining me now for this discussion on edge computing is Actual Tech Media partner, David Davis. David, good afternoon. Thanks for having me on, Keith. Oh, absolutely. So um, there, there's something I wanted to discuss with you today, David. It's a little bit sensitive, and it is the idea of dumb questions. What, what's your feeling on dumb questions? Dumb questions? There are no dumb questions, Keith. Let's play our new game, There Are No Dumb Questions. So let's get started with our first dumb question for today, David, on edge computing. And the first dumb question Number is, one. what the heck is edge computing anyway? Well, that's a great question, Keith. Um, and I want to point out to everyone out there in the audience, you know, there are no dumb questions. If you have a question, please ask. We encourage all questions. There are no questions uh, too dumb for, you know, our, our group here, our event, and and for technology in general, because technology is, is always challenging. There's always new technology. There's always new acronyms. And speaking of that, edge computing. What in the world is edge computing? So um, edge computing is defined over on Wikipedia. It's a distributed computing paradigm that brings computation and data storage closer to the source of data. So uh, think about that for a minute. You know, There's a lot of different use cases out there like autonomous you know, driving vehicles, there's uh, industrial sites, uh, healthcare, medical devices. You've got a whole bunch of data and images you know, close to um, the hospital or the patient. You've got retail locations, IoT devices, traffic management, security cameras with facial recognition. In all those scenarios, you've got a whole bunch of data and you need something to be done with that data very close to the, the data. So you know, you don't want to send that data off somewhere to the cloud and have it come all the way back. You need very low latency. Uh, the self-driving car can't, you know, think about, is that really a person there in the street and send that off to the cloud to consider that by the time that data comes back with the latency involved, the car could have already, you know, hit the person. So we don't want that to happen. We need to make decisions very quickly right next to the source of the data. Um, bandwidth could also be constrained. You could have uh, ships, you know, out in the middle of the ocean, connected by satellite or, or oil uh, platforms in the ocean. Uh, these locations have uh, bandwidth constraints, and the data uh, and the com computation needs to be right next to each other. 
So that's my definition of edge computing. Okay, that's I mean that's that's what that's what Wikipedia says and 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 to me that you know seems like a like a decent definition. But uh, coming to dumb question number 2 David. Number 2. Um isn't it also true that that the edge is 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 not as well defined for some people. Can't we sort of um, define what the edge is for for each environment, or is there one agreed upon definition? If I have a different setup than what you're describing here, do I not have an edge, or or what? So that would be my second dumb question. And yeah, that's a great co- question. I mean, th- I don't think there is any absolute you know right or wrong um, definition. Uh, you know, there's a lot of gray area, I think is, is what I'm trying to say when it comes to defining what is edge computing and what isn't edge computing. Um, you know, back in, in my day, we had uh, many retail locations, uh, we had manufacturing facilities, some of them had servers, you know, locally that would process the uh, drawings and the designs for the manufacturing um, pieces that were being made. And you know, we didn't call that edge computing back then, but you know, looking back on it now, I I guess it really was. Um, but so there's a whole lot of gray area, and so uh, I think there is an official definition, obviously, you know, from from Wikipedia, where the computation and the data are are close together at a some sort of remote site. But yeah, it, it, there's some gray area in there as well. And and how close and and how much processing goes on there is another part of that equation too. So. Number three, you alluded to this a minute ago. Dumb question number three. Um, You talked about robo, so remote uh, or branch office. This is what companies have had for a very long time. It always used to be called robo, wasn't it, Uh, way back then? So are we talking about the same thing? Is it all uh, just another, is edge in other words, just another name for robo? There's dumb question number three for you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Are, are Robo and Edge the same thing? And initially, when I heard about Edge, I thought about it. Well, that's that's just the same thing as Robo. But really, now that I understand Edge more and, and this importance about the data and the computation being close together, um, they're they're different. So to me, Robo now is the remote office. It's a location. And at that remote office, let's say you just have like, thin client devices that are accessing a a server back at headquarters, or they're just accessing the internet and they're accessing cloud, you know, SaaS applications. Well, that's not really edge computing because edge computing is where you have a lot of data and it needs computation and they need to be together. And that's what makes it edge computing. Whereas robo and remote office is just the place that you have devices connected to a WAN or connected to the internet. Hmm. So, the important question there, if you're the sysadmin um, for your remote and branch offices, does that make you a robocop? <laughs> Good one. Good one. I like that, Keith. I, I can't I can't help myself. <laughs> I just can't. Um, so David, let's get to let's get to uh, to dumb question that we know isn't really dumb. Question number four. Number Is anything four. that's not in your on-premises data center um on your network edge, I mean, is is, is it that obvious? I, I think there could be more to it than that. I mean, obviously, a lot of companies now, they have applications and data in the cloud. They have applications and data in a SaaS, you know, um, out on the internet. And they have partners and they have uh, integrations that are going on with other companies and data sharing and So there's a lot to consider there. It's not just uh, really cut and dry where anything not on-prem is the edge. Um, Again, edge goes back to data and uh, high volumes of data and computing happening all together at one place that's not the central data center. Got you. Got you. Thanks. Okay, now we come to our last dumb question, number five of this uh, keynote before we wrap it up. And this is probably the most important one of all. Um, okay, I'm ready. Why is it, David, that hot dogs come ten to a pack, but hot dog buns only come eight to a pack? Can you explain that? Well, Keith, you, we said there are no dumb questions, but I'm sorry, this is a dumb question. <laughs> uh, 
I mean, <laughs> I've I've looked into this. I've consulted, you know, physicists and scientists uh, across the spectrum, and they said uh, they did longitudinal studies on the shape of the buns and the package, and you know, eighty five percent of the time, you know, the the uh, hot two hot dogs are thrown away, or two people like to make double decker hot dogs. I don't know if you've ever done that, where you put two hot dogs in one bun really good it's a double hot dog um and and that's why Abs maybe it's a question more for philosophers to answer than than the rest of us i don't know it's like how many licks does it take to get to the middle of the, the tootsie roll pop we may never know you're you're showing your age you're showing your age um david this has been a lot of fun i really appreciate that and, and we i think did drop some knowledge on edge computing uh and hopefully uh people will take your advice to heart and ask questions during this uh, particular webinar. And uh, no question is dumb, except for the hot dog question. That was dumb, so don't ask that one today. And with that, we're gonna throw it back to you, Scott. All right, good stuff. Thanks, Keith and David. Um, and uh, before we get to the first question of the day, we do have a, uh, well, I shouldn't say the, the, or the first session of the day, we do have a, a quick poll question for you. And this is a time frame question. What's your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company? Options there are zero to six months, six to 12 months, 12 to 24 months, or not sure. So I can see those responses rolling in. We do really appreciate um, all of you uh, clicking on your keyboard there and, and giving us, uh, or clicking with your mouse and giving us, uh, you know, your your estimate for uh, what your plans are. Um, it's really helpful. And uh, you know, just so far, we're looking at uh, uh, probably the biggest group is is not sure. Uh, Thirty-eight percent right now. Uh, you know, and with uh, with responses rolling in. Um, so this is the, the perfect place for you to uh, to find out some information. Um, but we've also got a lot of people in the 6 to 12 month time frame, 28% right now, um, a lot in the 12 to 24, uh, 20%, and then 0 to 6 months is uh, is about 14% of the responses so far. So we'll just leave that up here for a second, um, and, uh, and then we will get rolling into our next session. Okay, well, thanks to everybody who's answered that poll. We'll go ahead and close that up. We do really appreciate it. And now it's time for our first presentation in the Edge Ecocast. And this session comes from Scale Computing. And presenting for Scale Computing is Dave Demlo, who's Vice President of Product Strategy at Scale. Dave, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much for having me, having me and thanks for everyone who's uh, joining. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to, you, to your presentation, so take it away. All right. So, um, yeah, I'm Dave Demel. I've been uh, with Scale Computing over 12 years and, and kind of seen uh, an evolution in, in IT space, you know, uh, uh, you know, rapid cloud adoption and a lot of applications being moved up to the cloud. Now seeing, you know, these new found, new applications that, that don't operate well in the cloud environment, and that's really been a, a big focus of Scale Computing uh, during that time. Is And then we'll go into, uh, you know, some of the problems that you'll face in these distributed edge environments. But really, you know, why are we here today? I mean, really it's, you know, still the, the same fundamental things that everyone in IT has been dealing with is, you know, just the reliance on IT infrastructure, information access, using it to provide access to, uh, you know, immediate access to information anywhere, automating workflows that streamline business prop, prop, uh, processes. Uh, and well, as, you know, more and more, and, and the edge really has brought this, being able to deliver new and you know, really engaging experiences for customers, employees, and so forth. And many of these applications are critical enough that when they fail or when you know, access to internet to connect, you know, connect to these applications, businesses literally stop. They may be things like you know, a manufacturing line that um, uh, you know, is inspecting parts and, and making real-time decisions as uh, items are being manufactured or a retail uh, self-checkout type application that, you know, cannot process orders and so forth. And we're going to talk about a lot of those different uh, use cases and how they uh, apply in the edge and some of the different ways that you can uh, account for various levels of 
data resiliency, application resiliency, as well as cloud connectivity uh, in your edge infrastructure design. So, you know, the first thing is why not all cloud? I mean, I kind of touched on some of the point, you know, why, you know, cloud can be, you know, provide instant scalability, you know, the ability to quickly, rapidly deploy new applications that, that meet business needs. Um, you know, uh, why, so why wouldn't you put everything in the cloud? Well, there's a bunch of reasons and, and, you know, different use cases will expose, you know, different constraints. You know, one of them often is cost. And, and when you're dealing with applications that, you know, involve, uh, large amounts of data. You know, we're seeing a, a rapid growth in things like computer vision and uh, uh, you know, video surveillance and analytics and things like that that you know require uh, processing very, very large data streams and sending all those that raw data to the cloud to be able to you know do facial recognition and, and then send responses back costs a lot of money uh, uh, as well as uh, there's a, a latency time involved. Many of these new applications, uh, you know, for example, the manufacturing line can't take the time to send those large data streams over a remote connection, wait for a remote analysis to be done, a response to sent back. Uh, you know, they need, you know, sub millisecond in many cases latency, but, you know, certainly a, you know, a few milliseconds of uh, being able to make quick decisions and be able to maybe do that in cases where you don't have uh, resilient internet connectivity uh, or none at all. We'll talk about some use cases uh, that, that, uh, Scale actually has a number of customers deploying, you know, things like ocean-going vessels that have intermittent connectivity and very, very expensive high-latency networking, uh, but yet have these needs for critical on-premises applications. Uh, and then often it's a regulation issue when you're dealing with, you know, moving data uh, between, um, you know, different uh, you know, political environments, different governments, different storage locations, or uh, dealing with uh, privacy information. Uh, you know, all the, the computer vision, you know, facial recognition, um, type applications, very often there are regulations that would prevent you uh, or put your company at, at risk if you possibly expose personal and uh, personally identifiable information like medical information or even in some cases just facial identity and so forth. You know, so as I mentioned, I mean, I've been with Scale a long time. I've been in the IT space for, you know, really my entire career. And, and so I can't say uh, the mainframe piece, but, you know, I jumped on board, you know, right in kind of the client server computer uh, phase. Um, you know, not to age myself, you know, things like Novell Netware and uh, early, you know, Windows NT and even things like OS2, you know, client server uh, computing where you had very centralized environments or decentralized environments still often connected into, you know, some central mainframe or BMS or, you know, uh, microcomputer, things like that. Uh, saw, you know, that client server computing start to see the benefits of centralization and things like shared infrastructure, uh, shared storage, you know, uh, uh, standardized IT practices, and including, you know, some of those being moved into cloud-type resources. So still central data centers, but instead of building, you know, corporate large and managing large corporate data centers, leveraging economies of scale in, in centralized cloud providers, and many applications that, you know, made sense. I mean, hosting an email server uh, you know, locally on-prem or in, in multiple offices uh, just doesn't make any sense whatsoever in, in this kind of world. But, you know, just 10 years ago, Running Microsoft Exchange on a box in every office was a very, very common practice. You know, that's all obviously moved to the cloud. Uh, but what we've seen is this, you know, emerging edge computing. And it's, in many cases, uh, driven by net new applications that, that just weren't possible, um, you know, years ago. Things, things that rely, as I mentioned, on, uh, you know, on-premises AI, machine learning, computer vision, doing, you know, real-time analytics and inference and so forth on the edge that are critical and require a new way of thinking of IT. So what is the edge? Just, uh, you know, our definition is it's the location where mission critical applications and infrastructure run close to or outside a central data center, and that would include cloud. So if you're running, you know, an application on premises, um, whether it's in one location or whether it's, you know, a thousand locations like a retail store, if you're running an application that's mission critical, uh, close to where that data is generating, being generated or close to where it's being used, like a retail store or a manufacturing facility or an ocean-going vessel or on and on and on, uh, that's the edge. And uh, that's what we're you know, here to talk about today is how do you uh, run those applications? Uh, uh, it, often they are distributed. Often they are in places that do not have IT. And that's where you know, the issues really get compounded. We do often see uh, these edge computings are multiple locations and tens, hundreds, or thousands of locations is not at all uncommon in our, in our customer base and, and the, the customers that we're selling to. And that introduces all sorts of technology issues, all sorts of people issues, all sorts of concerns over downtime. It's just, you know, if you've got 10,000 sites, 
pretty much, you know, even with the best IT practice, the most resilient resources, you're going to have something that needs attention, some monitoring that, you know, at, at just about any time, you know, something that you need to do, whether it's a simple failed hard drive that you need to, you know, get shipped out or replaced eventually, or, uh, you know, a new application that you need to deploy, all those things become much more difficult uh, and, and challenging across a distributed edge environment with lots of locations than, for example, deploying a new application on a, a central cloud. And that's really the gap that we're trying to bridge uh, in, uh, in our environment. We'll talk more about what we do. So, you know, edge deployments, you know, the, the things we generally see, um, you know, we see a lot of physical infrastructure. And, um, you know, often these are physical point solutions. A lot of times people don't even know how many of these things they have. You know, we'll talk into an environment and they may be bringing us in to consult about some new computer vision applications that they want to deploy and they're looking at what kind of hardware they need. And we'll look around or ask around. It's like, well, what's that thing over there? Oh, well, that's the box that controls the, uh, you know, monitors the freezer temperature. And, oh, that's the server that is the back end for the point of sale system. And, oh, that's the video security system. Uh, you know, all those different things, you know, that would rely on physical infrastructure. Um, you know, we also do see in more mature or larger scale environment, the use of virtualization. And often it's, you know, uh, either things like, you know, just two mirrored hosts with some, uh, you know, manual backup restore type capability or, or uh, things like that, generally not, you know, automated high availability in, in a lot of cases. Um, or, uh, you know, a 321 or 221 infrastructure where you've got multiple servers, a shared storage environment that does start to provide, you know, data failover and, and so forth there. And, you know, for those of us in IT who are familiar with these environments, there's a lot of, uh, of, of trade-offs, a lot of complexity in managing those. And so, you know, one of the things we talk customers through is kind of this concept of an available availability index. You know, you can um, you can do lots of things from you know start with a single you know single server, single box, fortify it with RAID or different storage that gives you a certain level of availability at a certain price point. You can you know uh, do replicated pairs that give you if you are actually doing mirroring with some level of ability to quickly switch over, some level of a level of higher availability, um, but um, you know, at a much higher cost. You're doubling everything. You're getting, you know, at, at least, uh, you know, double the resources. And very often what we see is these are, you know, fortified servers. So you're already doing, you know, RAID. You're already you know, doing a lot of built-in hardware redundancy for that. And then, you know, replicating, you know, mirroring everything twice. Um, you know, we tend to, uh, uh, one of the things that we're, we're very good at are these three-node configurations and providing these three-node configurations with smaller devices that are, are uh, uh, small form factor, lower cost, that are really well tuned, and to where very often the three-node system is less than the cost of replicated pairs, and you get much higher availability and, and a much, much higher utilization, because you're not like having a full standby system sitting there doing nothing most of the time. Um, so we can walk customers through, and we offer solutions in all these spaces, depending on the need of the application, but being able to have the same system, same management infrastructure is really key. And so kind of introducing our entire platform, uh, the, the product suite overall is called Scale Computing Platform, and what we provide is this all-in-one infrastructure that is cloud-managed, centrally managed. So we just re uh, introduced a product last year called uh, Scale Computing Fleet Manager. That's your centralized, cloud-based management and orchestration at scale. We'll talk about some of the capabilities. And then for the on-premises systems that it manages, this is, um, uh, you know, we, it's hyper-converged, meaning that the, the systems you buy fully integrate the storage, the compute, the virtualization stack software, uh, the ability to run containers, the ability to do, you know, snapshotting, disaster recovery, replication, all those things built in on premises. And as I showed in the previous slide, uh, you know, different sizes, res resilient configurations that let you kind of pick and choose what you need at each location for each application. And where applicable, you know, we, we can help customers consolidate all those individual piecemeal point solutions into a single centrally managed platform. Um, you know, so uh, different ways of doing this, doing virtualization. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. We can go deep. Uh, in our hyperconverged solution, that's really, again, the architecture that integrates all the compute storage together. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, one way is to basically take what would have been a shared storage system, a, a device, virtualize it as a VM. That's called a VSA, or virtual storage appliance. Run that on every system you have out there and then aggregate the storage together. So basically you have a software SAN, and a big workload that's running on top of that. Um, doing that, um, one of the downsides or one of the considerations on the edge especially is that 
VSA application uh, requires an enormous amount of resource, um, a lot of RAM uh, for caching, a lot of CPU cores to serve up the storage. I mean, it's basically doing all the network protocols. It's using iSCSI or it's using NFS or, uh, you know, those kinds of things just to provide storage to applications that are running locally. We d designed and developed a, in a fully integrated um, um, HCI model where the storage layer is built right in, and that makes it very, very efficient. So on the bare operating system that we provide in the appliance on the metal, uh, that provides the storage stack. There's no external storage uh, uh, protocols. There's no virtual storage appliance. Uh, so we just use a really a fraction of a core processing for that and, and very little RAM uh, per system in order to provide hyperconvergence. And when you look at our product line, we have systems that go down as small as 16 gigabytes of RAM and just a few cores, uh, which is more than adequate for a lot of edge applications. And it's very, very important that you be efficient uh, on, on your resource utilization in those cases. Again, we designed this edge solution cohesively from the ground up, really and been expanding it for more than a decade. So we understand, you know, the environment that exists in the edge. There's very often limited or no IT staff. And so um, uh, we recently introduced zero touch provisioning where uh, the central IT team can configure what that system is supposed to be, ship it out via UPS, uh, have a store manager or somebody with, you know, very little training, uh, plug in a power cable, plug in a network cable, have the system phone home and configure itself in your fleet and then configure applications. Uh, very often there's physical constraints on just, you know, the size or the power consumption or the heat uh, dissipation of a particular environment. So we have devices that are designed to be very small. Uh, if, you're, if you're familiar with the Intel NUC platform, uh, we have an enterprise version of that, you know, the, the little four inch by four inch cubes. Uh, that can cluster together for high availability and run, you know, an, an amazing, impressive amount of applications. Um, so solutions that run autonomously so they can handle connectivity outages. They can run, keep the application running locally, even if there's limited or, or disruptions in, in uh, Internet connectivity. And then being able to handle unpredictable demands. And un unpredictable demands could be, you know, an influx of data that needs to be processed, and that might require, uh, you know, deploying new uh, nodes in this case, and then scaling out the hyperconverged infrastructure very easily and seamlessly. Uh, that could, uh, you know, also just be things like, you know, new applications. We we find, you know, uh, very often uh, our customers once they have this centralized infrastructure and they see how easy it is that that is basically as easy to deploy a new application in a matter of days or weeks versus you know months or years uh, out to a a large uh, distributed environment. Uh, that you know, just enables them, once they know that they have that ability, uh, the business units just want to be able to, you know, get these things out and, and uh, as quickly as possible. So what we provide is an infrastructure that cares for itself. Again, there's no IT personnel on site, so availability is built in uh, to the architecture. Simplicity, uh, uh, you know, being able to centrally manage these, efficiency, as I talked about, making sure that uh, the resources are available to do the work that you care about, the, the applications that provide bil uh, business value, and flexibility. So the ability to, uh, you know, have a, a wide range of systems, the ability to scale out what you need. And by the way, you can scale out with different systems over time. They don't need to be uh, the same exact node type or same hardware configuration. You can mix and match, things like that. So uh, we really took a, a lot of care in, in future-proofing uh, the edge environment to be able to handle all these things that are needed today as well as the things that are very likely coming. And, uh, you know, we recognize that, uh, you know, there's going to be cloud-based applications and, you know, cloud is great for many of these things. There's going to be edge applications uh, that, you know, are increasing to, you know, need resources, need compute, need things like GPU uh, for inferencing and, and so forth. Uh, and uh, we offer products that, that meet all of those needs as well as we can help you connect those into those public cloud resources and services uh, that are already there, you know, whether it's, you know, passing IoT data, whether it's, you know, leveraging cloud for training uh, models that are then executed on the edge, things like that. Uh, you know, we can offer all those uh, solutions uh, together. Uh, we talked about this again. It's an integrated platform designed for the edge. So you're getting, you know, from one vendor, uh, the on-premises piece that, you know, running your applications uh, and all the capabilities built in out of the box, no separate hypervisor to go out and license, no integration to do on your own. Uh, as well as, you know, full automation, uh, you know, to, to do that. So, uh, you know, we talked about the fleet manager with the central monitoring and management. Other things that it does, it's the hub that provides that uh, zero-touch provisioning that I mentioned uh, briefly uh, so that when systems are deployed, they just phone home the fleet manager. They've already got, got all their instructions, their configuration. They come online. Uh, there's a new capability that uh, we're introducing now called Secure Link that from the fleet manager console, 
You can, without any VPN connection, drill right down into any of the edge locations um, and, you know, for orchestration, for automation, for, you know, troubleshooting or whatnot. Uh, but, you know, uh, really our goal is to provide that end-to-end -end, uh, uh, complete edge, you know, data center to edge, one integrated platform, uh, and handle everything from, you know, day one initial provisioning, getting the workloads online uh, with automation, uh, uh, we have an Ansible collection, for example, that can, you know, deploy and configure your applications fresh from scratch, can handle things like, you know, importing existing applications, can also handle day two operations where you need to expand resources, you need to add a new, uh, you know, new application very rapidly out to the fleet. All that can be done in an automated way, which is really essential when you start talking about hundreds or certainly thousands of sites. Um, so we've um, really focused on that. I mentioned, you know, uh, a wide range of platforms. So you can see on the left side of the screen that HE100 series, that would be a micro edge platform. Those are actually based on the enterprise form of an Intel NUC, but they're very, um, you know, very small, but very powerful and also very easy to consume. I mean, those are the kinds of things that, you know, literally with one network cable and one power cable and zero touch provisioning, you can send these out without any IT people to, you know, plug in, bring itself online, phone home, and then handle all of the management remotely. Uh, we have that up to, you know, very high-end data center type machines, GPU loaded, you know, NVMe storage, uh, you know, uh, as well as specialized nodes that we've targeted for, uh, you know, capacity type solutions like uh, video, uh, video surveillance where you may have large retention requirements and so forth, uh, as well as cloud platforms. And this is both uh, our uh, scale computing uh, cloud unity platform that we provide. We've also, as I mentioned, spent a lot of time making sure that our solutions and the applications that our customers want to run can also integrate with the public cloud solutions of their choice. So, you know, whether it's uh, Microsoft Azure and integrating resources into Azure Arc uh, uh, or, you know, Google Anthos running, you know, their Kubernetes distribution on premises, we've worked through all those uh, types of integrations and can make those available to, to very quickly uh, deploy those types of solutions. Uh, so with that, um, let's see if we uh, have any uh, questions here. Yeah, Dave, we did, uh, and uh, I, I really like that sine wave uh, that you showed early on for the sort of the oscillation between centralization <laughs> and distributed computing over the, the decades. Pendulum, That's a great yeah. representation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and while we do see what questions uh, we've got here, I will put up just a poll question about you know additional information that people would like to see about scale computing. Um, and I'll also mention, uh, be sure to download the PDF uh, in your handout section from, from scale computing. But yeah, let's get into the question. So we have a few related questions from Peter and JD and some others on a theme, which, which sort of boils down to this. What are the primary drivers for running applications on premises at the distributed edge versus in the public cloud? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I had a slide that kind of touched on, on several of them, I mean, but um, they're going to be very, you know, business specific. I mean, often it is, um, you know, in many cases the application just can't, or, you know, we, and we've definitely worked with customers that have tried you know, sending large amounts of data to a cloud, doing some processing there, waiting for an, an you know, answer back, and whether it's, you know, the latency of round trip, whether it's the cost of sending all that data back and forth, uh, whether it's the, you know, response time that's required, making these split-second decisions. That's kind of one class of, you know, problems. The other thing we do to see are, and I, I saw a couple of questions here on kind of the governance pieces of, you know, can I, you know, send data from one country to another, or is there a, you know, cloud provider that's close enough that, uh, you know, data sovereignty type of issues um, or, you know, personally identifiable information, you know, GDPR or California type, uh, you know, restrictions where uh, being able to do all that processing on premises where the data is secured, it's not traversing a, you know, a, rem a network, it's not being sent to the internet, can have, you know, both those compliance benefits and cost and then reliability. I mean, uh, different parts of the globe, you know, we have, you know, uh, areas where, Internet can be cheap and resilient, and multiple connections aren't, aren't that much of a problem. So we, you know, there's lots of areas that are, you know, 100% the op opposite, where uh, relying on at any moment, you know, having any connectivity, much less fast, robust, you know, guaranteed latency uh, connectivity is just not available. But usually they fall into kind of those categories. Either the application just cannot be run at, you know, with the uh, service level that's provided, or there's some kind of compliance or business or privacy requirement that dictates, you know, we want to keep the data local and do the processing there. And then the other kind of interesting thing with Edge we find is a lot of that data then is by design thrown away. You know, once you've done the analysis locally, you've extracted the information you need, you've made that real-time decision that, that your application is needed, 
you've got the metrics, you've got the telemetry, and the telemetry is what's important, and that gets shipped up to a cloud for long-term storage. It goes to a data lake, things like that. But the raw data uh, at that point, you know, often is um, um, just ephemeral and doesn't need to be kept around. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Um, got some also, also some questions just sort of about, I guess, architecture and scalability. So this, this first one just comes from Shridhar, and I, and I think this, this question came in before – your graphic showing like the different levels of platforms, but you know the question yeah. was, do you have a hardware plus software or is it a software only solution? So I, I guess the question is, uh, is there a software only option or is it all, um, are they all like hardware or appliances? Yeah, it, it's a tough one to answer. I mean, we we are a software company, and but what we have found yep. is um, for especially edge reliability, we we basically have a very very strict, well-tested, and maintained um, HCL that you don't even have to worry about. I mean, I think HCL is a bad word. You know, like if you have to go out and worry about, you know, hey, is this piece of hardware work with my software? Or, hey, I'm about to do a software upgrade. Is my hardware compatible or not? That's, you know, our customers and our prospects don't want to deal with that across a large fleet. I mean, so we – we generally sell as an appliance, uh, but there are different channels that you can buy from. And, and, and in the end, we are a software, uh, you know, a software solution. But but uh, we make sure that it uh, is available, and, and some does depend on your scale. So we have very large end user customers who, you know, have their own hardware platform. And if it's a sufficient scale, we will basically add that to our HCL, which for us means we've got, you know, a large number of systems in our labs. We're doing regression testing every time we make any changes. Uh, but uh, from a quality perspective, we want to make sure that nobody – that we fully understand the details of hardware. And uh, for those who have dealt with hardware levels, you know, a hard drive is not a hard drive. And a flash drive is not a flash drive. And so we, you know, down right. to, you know, specific firmware versions, we do testing on those. We handle updates like, you know, uh, if there's a, a BIOS update for a piece of hardware that we provide or support – we actually will handle updating that and making sure that, you know, it's upgraded as a unit with software that's been tested with it. So all those kinds of things that, you know, especially across these large distributed fleets will in, undoubtedly eventually shoot you in the foot. We handle all those for you. So whether, so in the end, it is an appliance, how it gets to you can vary a little bit, but the general thing is an, an appliance with the software preloaded. Um, and uh, so, now, like I said, it's a tough one to answer because it is software under the hood, but right. Um, right. I guarantee that that QA, you know, that that customer experience is generally delivered as, as an appliance. Yep. Yeah. Great. And before we get to the next question, I'm, I just want to thank everybody for answering this poll. Um, but I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and and switch back to this slide. I think for this question, it might make it easier to to talk about. Okay. We have a scalability question from Edgar, who's who's saying, you know, what are the scalability limitations on the on the stack? And and uh, I I thought maybe this might be helpful to. Um, you know, to sort of go through. Yeah. Um, well, and yeah, scalability means a whole lot of things. So, I mean, we, we have nodes that go into, you know, multi petabyte type, you know, on premises clusters. Yeah. And then I guess, you know, scalability from the fleet standpoint, um, you know, we have customers well over a thousand sites with, you know, often multiple clusters per site and, you know, a fleet of 10,000 plus 50,000 locations is, you know, our goal is to make that manageable. And I think I saw another question about, you know, well, is it harder to deploy remotely on the cloud? Obviously, yes, things are different, you know, but uh, our goal and, and uh, with the automations that we provide, um, if somebody came to me and, and said, hey, our problem is we, you know, we have a new container application we're building. We want to be able to uh, deploy it daily, build, update, push it out, uh, you know, across 10,000 locations. Um, you know, we, we do that. We, we will manage the hardware for you. We will manage the deployment of, you know, those applications, the updating of those applications. We have, you know, the automation tools to, you know, handle things. I thought there was a question about patching and software updates. Um, you know, that's why we have all those interfaces. So, um, you know, the, uh, the Ansible collection, for example, that, you know, not only can help you orchestrate the fleet, you know, can also be the same tool uh, that, you know, goes in and, and does Windows updates if you're a Windows customer or deploys new containers or patches or things like that. And, uh, you know, the, so you can use, you know, one kind of tool stack to orchestrate, you know, one site just as easily as 10,000 sites. And, uh, mm -hmm. but again, yeah, from the hardware standpoint, I think I covered, you know, individual nodes. Uh, we have, you know, nodes that are designed for, you know, GPU, VDI computing uh, that are designed for, uh, you know, high capacity storage retention, you know, that have a, 
you know, 18, 18 terabyte drives sitting in and that uh, cluster together and scale out and, you know, for uh, video surveillance and, and retentions. Yeah. Okay, super. That's great. Um, and uh, I, what types of applications uh, can I run on SC HyperCore? Yeah, and, and really our goal is we want to be the platform for all your applications so that you don't need to deploy point deploy or manage point solutions and deal with the hardware, deal with the operating system stack, things like that. I mean, and so, you know, the, the simple answer is, Anything, pretty much anything that runs on x86, um, you know, infrastructure. So, you know, Windows, Linux, we do certifications with all the, the major vendors there. We have a, a support matrix of all the, the versions that, that we test with there. And then, you know, any applications that run on, on top of that. Uh, you know, also, as I mentioned a couple times, you know, container, you know, Docker runtimes, OCI container runtimes. Um, you know, just if you're doing Kubernetes at the edge, and, and there are some interesting, we've, we've worked with, you know, basically any flavor of Kubernetes, uh, you know, uh, K3S is a very popular Kubernetes distribution for the edge, and we have the tools and, and so forth that can help you both deploy those, deploy applications onto those, keep those up to date, you know, whether it's, yeah, legacy virtual machine workloads, and, you know, we find, you know, a lot of customers, the key is they have both, you know, there's a lot of in manufacturing, some very, very old Windows boxes that, you know, talk to very, very old PLCs, and those have to be there for a while, and, you know, yet there's, you know, new type of, you know, IoT applications that are often containerized and so forth. And we want to be the infrastructure that lets you manage those uh, and deploy those and update those uh, across any number of sites very easily. Okay. All right. Well, Dave, thanks for being so generous with your time. Really appreciate all this, these insights here in the, in the Q&A and in the presentation. And just one last one. If, if somebody wants to get started with scale uh, or find out more, what do, you, what do you recommend that they do? Uh, go to our website, scalecomputing.com. We've got, you know, lots of great resources there. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, you can uh, chat with us online or get uh, in touch with someone, and they can, they can assess your environment, assess your needs, uh, find, you know, similar case studies, vertical markets, things like that, uh, that uh, you know, can help uh, kind of as a blueprint for customers that have done similar uh, type of things. And uh, but that's where I would start. All right. Well, Dave, thanks again. Really appreciate you coming on. Thank you much. Thanks. And now it's time for our next prize drawing. The winner of the, the $300 Amazon gift card, the first one of the day, is Ben Furman from Massachusetts. So congratulations to Ben. We'll be in touch about claiming your prize. And now it's time for our next presentation in the EcoCast about integrating edge computing into your architecture. And this session comes from Rubrik. And presenting for Rubrik is Matt Dove, who's a senior sales engineer. Uh, let me turn things over to Matt. All right, so kind of looking at what we're trying to do here today, um, I think what we wanted to focus on is enhancing your, again, the security posture across your private, public, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud environment. And one of the things that Rubrik does from a cloud data management perspective, I think is really extend well into that process. Um, you know, what we see right now, oftentimes in our, uh, ecosystem of partners and prospects and customers are really three things that come top of mind when you start talking about the sprawling data center, right, within multiple clouds. Cyber resiliency, right, so ransomware, ransomware remediation. I, I don't think you can uh, turn on your computer in the morning without seeing three updates about something like that. So how to build a, a platform that focuses on um, cloud security and data security and be resilient to one of these events. Uh, the underpinning of that being a, a backup and recovery strategy, I think that it's cost efficient, right? So you're, it's insurance, but on some level you're not going to pay 10 times the insurance that you did yesterday, right, even for a better solution. So making that a cost protect, uh, uh, cost efficient strategy. And then within these multi-cloud, hybrid cloud um, environments, de-risking that journey, like wherever you are within your status, whether you're just trying to get into figuring out what to do in the cloud or whether you're trying to get momentum to get there. So kind of de-risking that from a, a perspective. So what Rubrik kind of does within this, it's a it's really a zero trust data management platform that starts in the bottom tier, right? Your, your kind of traditional on-prem data center, all the different data sources that we can talk about. 
We've extended that into the public clouds, all the major public cloud providers. And then we've put a policy framework in place that it has an immutable uh, file system, allows you to kind of really have that air gap, to logically air gap data set uh, of your production environment. Policy-based protection strategies, so you're not scheduling jobs, you're trying to eliminate the, the manual intervention that you have to go through to, to maintain data protection. Do things like detect anomaly, right? Not just detect high change rates and things like that, but actually look at the data set and tell you what's happening at your data set level and then really kind of extend application recovery, be able to recover that quickly. So from that perspective, you know, if you look at kind of like the traditional environment, the legacy backup where you have agents and proxies and servers and data movers pushing data onto storage, there's a lot of complex parts there that take a lot of man hours to, to go ahead and then uh, manage it and maintain it and always know about it. We kind of wrap that up into a single view for cloud data management where we can push data across all the different tiers and give you one kind of cohesive data protection strategy that blends across all of the management layers of this multi-cloud environment. And then we do that from a zero trust perspective, right, where we orchestrate that, but we do it from a manner where we can really kind of lock down the access to the data. So modern data protection strategy, you know, you have a bunch of different pieces here. Uh, we kind of collapsed that into one hyper-converged appliance. We've eliminated a lot of the legacy architecture pieces. Uh, and accelerating the recovery, the ability for us to then automate and kind of procedurally at scale recover the data set that you care about. Again, with our kind of approach uh, with SLA policy-based information and then eliminating the renewals, right? Eliminating all these different siloed, different tiers and different uh, tool sets that you'll have for each different unique data set that might be in a different cloud. So again, the, the, the idea of a cost-efficient approach to that uh, with Rubrik. So big threat right now, uh, cybersecurity event, you know, you get a ransomware attack. It locks down your data set. So you have to figure out, well, what am I going to do? What's my approach? So I pay the ransom, which nobody really wants to do, so I, I attempt to recover it. It's probably your first option. So you engage like your tech ops and IT ops teams to go ahead and try to identify what happened. Can I do a restore where the backup's compromised? You pay the ransom. Uh, if they weren't compromised, then you can actually do the restore. Well, then you have that secondary day two operation piece. You know, how, what do I recover? How far, go, how far back in time do I go to recover it? So there's a lot of complexity with trying to identify what to do inside of a cyber event, and all of this is on the fly. These these procedures are generally not predefined, um, not very well at least. So our kind of extension is to take the principles of data protection that matter, you know, air gap data, immutable uh, file system, zero trust architecture, and we kind of focus on the sweet spot, right? Logical backups on offline, uh, logically air gap data set. They cannot be edited. You know, we wrote our own file system that's immutable in format, and zero trust. Right. We don't assume uh, anything has the right to actually access or control data sets unless it's a certificate-based mutual authentication call. So our approach then allows you to kind of really focus, focus security at the data point. We are not endpoint protection. We are not a security tool set. We're really the, the backup safeguard. So what we're going to do is, hey, the ransomware happened. Can you recover? Well, you engage your SecOps team, and what we're going to really do is our backups are safeguarded because they're immutable in first touch. We then scope the attack for you. We have a SAS offering that tells you specifically down to the file if the entropies or other, other items have happened. And then what we do is focus on how do we go ahead and deliver that out and, and recover that fast in an automated and orchestrated fashion. So it's a really a different approach altogether to data protection uh, with data security as its underpinning. Everything done from the perspective of a SAS offering so we don't want to impact your production workloads to do this. It's all done from a at the back of a state, right? So that's a pretty significant little piece for us. So now what I want to do is actually show you what it looks like uh, to have a single strategy that focuses on data security, that focuses on providing a secure platform to ingest your data, that focuses on the ability of a better backup solution, take workload off your team's plate, have one team be able to control a consistent data protection strategy across the multitudes of clouds and workload uh, locations that you have, and also do it in a cyber resilient manner, a way that in case the four walls of your data center break down, in case you have an event, which is more and more likely every day, 
that you have the ability to guarantee your uh, recoverability of all your sensitive data, all the data that matters to your environment. What that looks like from our perspective is you have this global view. It starts with the ability for us to kind of give you information around warm premise workloads, cloud-based workloads, uh, SaaS offerings, N365, things of that nature. And what I want to do is just showcase how we start moving data, right? The first thing that we're going to do is look at GPS, which is kind of our ability to look at all workloads in all environments. So I'm going to focus first on clusters. Clusters are on-premise workloads for us, right? So you may have, we have 10 data centers to look at here that are all over Johannesburg and Mumbai and Los Angeles. So all your physical on-premise environments, where your data resides in your physical presence that matters to you. I want to focus on one, Amer Rubric 1. On that environment, it starts with better backup. We're going to talk about security and security posture across multi-cloud, but it all starts with having a secure framework for a better backup platform. The secure plane for having our own immutable file system as we ingest the data set is now immune from a cyber event from happening. How do we help you adopt a cloud journey if you haven't already started one? The first one, first piece is getting your data to a cloud, right? Takes about five minutes to set up an archival location for us. We support all of the major cloud providers, some smaller cloud environments, it just needs to be S3 compatible. So you choose the cloud that you want to move into. You want to start your, dipping your toe in the water if you don't really have a defined strategy. We get your data out there. We get your data out there from an automated protection policy perspective. We're going to let you do something like take a policy instead of you having to create all the different workloads and jobs and scheduling things to move from one location to another. What we're going to simply do is create a policy based protection strategy. Continuous data protection. Do you want it? Do you want a sub one minute RPO recovery point for very critical workloads? You enable it. It's a checkbox. You don't need it for that. It's a less critical workload. You disable it. You start with the base frequency and the base retention of everything that you want to recover, right? It's about base frequency. How often am I taking the snapshot? Retention. How long do I want to keep each one of those base frequencies? And the next is now the lifecycle management of where it resides inside that, in this case, three year piece. I don't want to keep data forever, right? I want to be able to do a mass recovery at scale for fast impacted data. You recover data sets from short periods of time ago, 30 days. I'll keep it in on prem. I'm going to send it to a second site for a DR event, keep it there for 14 days. You know, I don't need to recover in a DR event generally from more than a couple of days, but I'll keep it there for 14 days. But I also need to make sure I can recover data for the entire duration of time that I'm that I'm talking about. Well, let's use cloud storage. I'm going to instantly send this out to the default tier in this case of Azure, right? I can send it directly out to the archive tier if you'd want. We also support again if we go to like an AWS policy, you can send it to the default storage class. You can send it out to Glacier or Glacier Deep Archive. You can really start driving down operational costs. You want a cost efficient data management platform. In addition. Now we've simplified getting that policy-based assignment, creating a protection strategy that gets your data off to the cloud. To deploy it, you can do it at any level. Virtualized environments, you get a very quick look at what the workload is, what the protection strategy is, whether it was derived from a higher level tag, you know, making sure that the child objects always had the same protection policies, or whether it's directly assigned. The idea is you never have a miss. We support all the main hypervisors. We support physical workloads in your data center, NAS shares, SQL, Oracle, whatever database platforms you have. The idea that you never have a miss, it's an automated deployment strategy that automatically finds new data and assigns a policy to it because it's a set and forget kind of a model. The key part, as soon as we touch the data, it's immutable. You can't be impacted by that cyber event. Well, that's great. Everything is also automated. Everything is an API call down to this UI. There's no software, you're not managing an application, pointing data to a database, you're managing an API call to an appliance. These API calls are well established. We have entire code banks that you can lift and adapt into your environment to simplify all the day two operations. So it's better backup, that's secure, underpinning of security. So now I have better backup platform strategy. I have a way to manage better backup for all of my on-premise environments. It doesn't help me in multi-cloud or hybrid cloud. That's on-premise. So Hybrid cloud looks like inventory, right? I have SaaS offerings. I have 
AWS and Azure and Google Cloud, all these different cloud environments that I have workloads in, it's the same strategy. I take an SLA-based policy assignment. I choose an application or a web service that I want to go ahead and back up. And I have the same exact strategy about how often and how long. And so I take a backup every day for a month. I have extended retention on some of it. Where do I want it to sit within that entire time? Do I want to replicate it to a secondary AWS region or Azure region? You can choose that. How long do you want it to sit in that second region? And then do I want to do log backups? You know, something very simple. Now the idea is I have a exa exactly similar process to what I've done on-premise for SQL and VMware and Hyper-V, AHV, Oracle. I've extended that out to the cloud. I've given you the exact same protection strategy protection tool set, whether it's an on-premise or a cloud native workload. So that's great. How do I apply it? Same, same exact concept. At any one of these cloud inventories I can go to and I can make, we're gonna use the native terminology from the platform and allow you to make an assignment at any level of it. AWS, I can go to Azure, looks a little bit different, but it's the same general construct, subscriptions, resource groups, tag rules, the things that those cloud native providers allow us to assign protection policies to. So now I have SLA policies, secure platform to ingest the data that's immune from ransomware, that has a consistent data protection policy across all of your multi-cloud environments. The last thing I want to do then is talk about, well, cyber resiliency. You know, we, we'd, we'd address cyber resiliency a lot within the environment. I want to be able to recover from a ransomware event. Like if something happens, I need to be able to identify it and recover quickly. Well, phase one is your backup is immutable. You can always, you're guaranteed to be able to recover. Phase two is we need to help you do it quickly. We're not looking for things like high levels of change and last night's backup, right? It, you know, an, a big incremental backup is just a big incremental backup. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a ransomware event. We wanna do things like what happened? Here it's high confidence and high levels of encryption. We're gonna let you look down into the actual snapshot and browse down what was impacted. When we detect the anomalous behavior, we're gonna look at it. We're gonna see what's inside of that anomalous behavior set and tell you all the way down to an individual file, what was impacted, what happened, let you filter out to the noise so you can focus on just the impacted data. We're not scanning for malware. We're not looking for virus signatures or ransomware signatures. Some of those are day zero, they don't help. What we're doing is detecting anomalous behavior because we're looking at your data from today and comparing it to yesterday, this Monday to last Monday, and we're identifying behaviors that are abnormal and alerting you to it and telling you why we think it's abnormal. This is not something that typically happens. Then you go ahead and choose whatever it is that you need to recover, whether it's one or 10 different workloads that were impacted, and you hit recover. This is now where you start really driving down a recovery time on a cyber event. If you have 100 terabytes of front-end data that we're protecting, you don't have 100 terabytes of data typically impacted by a cyber event. You might have 10, 20, 30. But it's identifying the blast radius that matters. We've just shown you very easily, you can go down to an individual file. You can now automate the recovery at scale in whatever method you see fit. And when you hit recover, it just makes a call back down to the appliance to start actually recovering all those jobs and all those functions to the point in time you've chosen. You're not rolling back 30 days. You're recovering the specified file sets that were impacted, the specified VMs or shares, and you're recovering them back to a specified time that we know is when the data changed. Now you have the post-mortem, right? You're up and running, the, the business is functioning. And now you have to answer the question, what was impacted? So the next piece is then, what was inside the data set that was impacted by the ransomware event? And that's where we then start giving you the intelligence around what types of data, sensitive data that you have. It can be canned things like, uh, you know, driver's license and bank routing. They can be custom items like customer IDs within your organization, employee IDs. You create analyzers, you put them in policies and you scan your data. And what we then do give you back is a very granular look at how many files have sensitive data in it? How many sensitive data hits are in those files? Do you have any files that have open access? Meaning I have sensitive data in it and I don't have proper security controls around the share. So what kinds of things, what kind of intelligence can I do? And all of this is a SaaS offering. It's a checkbox. There's zero deployment of agents and proxies. It's a zero lift deployment from an infrastructure perspective and there's zero impact on production environment. You're not doing things that are impacting 
your hypervisors and your physical workloads out there. And you're not spinning up more infrastructure to look at this. It's all done off the backup state. So at a high level, that's what we wanted to focus on. How do we deliver a consistent strategy for on-prem, public cloud, hybrid cloud? It has to have an underpinning of security. It has to have a zero trust architecture. It has to be able to deliver a cyber resilient uh, offering. And you have to do it in a way that's cost effective. So that's what we wanted to focus on today. Thank you for your time. Great presentation, Matt. Really cool to see that demo. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we do have some questions for you from the audience, if you're ready. I am ready. Here's a question from Scott, Matt, who wants to know, how can I ensure that once my backup data is written, that it can never be changed? Uh, we do that specifically. We wrote our own file system. Uh, it's a Debian-based operating system. We've actually eliminated the edit and modify commands. So the only thing that you can do is append. Uh, so as we commit our data to disk, we actually abstract it through an append-only file format. So any data that's been committed to disk is a full strike right in a new set of blocks. So we do that at our, effectively at our, um, at our own OS level within our hyperconverged appliance. Excellent. And then uh, there's a couple questions here kind of around ransomware. Like, how do I uh, know that the ransomware didn't encrypt my backup data as well? And, and how do I know when I go to restore, you know, if I have a ransomware attack, how do I know that I'm not just restoring files that are already infected? A few questions around that. So the first piece is our platform, the actual rubric platform, is immune from being encrypted. And, and we kind of talked about that a little bit with the append-only file format. Since we're never writing uh, data in native source file format, whatever ransomware uh, event has happened, if we ingest it onto the platform, it doesn't have lateral movement, right? It's been, it's been encrypted uh, and sent to our disk. So it doesn't have the ability to burn down your recovery times. The second part is we integrate with other pieces. We are not a security tool, right? So this, today we have lots of different vendors on here today that can talk to you about the forensics of what happened, what was the actual ransomware signature, um, and all of those other tool sets can help you identify the actual hash, the things that have been edited. Our ability to recover, you can recover in isolation, so you can actually search for things like affected hashes within specific files that some of these security vendors that are actually focused on security um, can tell you about. Excellent. Uh, Steven's asking, what does a restore look like? Like, what's the general process for restoring? You want to talk about recovery a little bit? Sure. A recovery effort for us is, you know, within our platform, it's a global, you know, search query. So you type in the information that you're trying to recover, whether that's an email in M365, a subject, or whether it's a VM or a database on an on-premise environment. Uh, we identify, hey, this is everything we've done because we index every file and every bit of information that we ingest. You then get a card. The card tells you everything that you need to know about this. You can choose the point in time that you want to recover to. Uh, the recovery workflow then becomes uh, optional for you, depending on what it is. We can do a live mount, you know, where we're taking a database and presenting it as an SMB share. We can do an instant recovery of an entire VM. You can recover one single file of a VM back to production, you know, LM host file. So the recovery workflow becomes very simple, but each one is a little bit different depending on whether it's a database or it's an individual file, whether it's a physical server or a NAS share. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I can see where that would be different depending on what you're recovering. Um, this is a good question. What about uh, RPO and RTO? How do we, do we have any idea uh, ahead of time of, of what that would be? Yeah, the RPO is 100% is a function of what your business wants the RPO to be for that data set, right? You value the data. I don't want to have more than a four-hour gap of time. So you define your RPO. Where Rubrics assists is driving the RTO down to near zero, right? So for a database, I can have a database spun up from a point in time that you've chosen uh, and presented for you to write queries against inside of two minutes. So your RTO is approaching, you know, sub one minute time. A VM, I can live mount. Uh, in sub one minute because it's just promoting that backup from my storage into your compute environment, right? So these are all things that can be near into instantaneous. For the ransomware piece, that's what that, that kind of orchestrated call is. Driving the RTO down means minimizing how much data I need to recover. 
and then automating the recovery. You're not kicking off 50 different restore jobs. You're choosing the data that was impacted and hitting go, and then we do the orchestration from an automated fashion behind you. So RPO is completely in your control. RTO is what we control at Rubric, and we drive that close to zero with the automation processes around the, the recovery workflows. Nice. All right. Well, Matt, I'm afraid that's all the time we have here in our live Q&A. Uh, there's a number of more technical questions for you there in the electronic queue, but a really great presentation and cool demo. Thanks for being on. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Okay, well, Matt Dove, great presentation, uh, and thank you so much for educating us on Rubric. And next to my colleague, David Davis, for uh, for moderating the questions there. Uh, we do have a poll question here for, for everybody in the audience. We appreciate your feedback on additional resources you, that you would like to see from Rubric. I'd also like to remind you at this point about the handouts. We do have a link from Rubric, so be sure to check that out um, if you'd like some more detail. We'll also leave the poll up there while we do our final prize drawing of the event. So the winner of our second $300 Amazon gift card is Jacob Rial from Texas. And the winner of our third and final $300 Amazon gift card for the day is Rod McCorkle of New Hampshire. So congratulations to Jacob Rial, Rod McCorkle, and Ben Furman from the first drawing. We will be in touch about claiming your prizes. And thanks to everybody who's responded to the poll. We appreciate your feedback, and I'll just leave it up here for another moment, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, our, our final few items. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll. Uh, thanks again for responding. And uh, if you were watching this event today and thinking this type of event would be the ideal platform to tell folks about your platform or solution, we'd love to hear from you to help you determine which of our hundreds of events each year would be a good fit for you. So you can contact us at connect at actualtechmedia.com. And we do have another great event coming up tomorrow if you're not already signed up for it. It's a, a mega cast on minimizing RTO and RPO best practices for bulletproof backup and ultra-fast recovery. So that one starts at noon Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. You can see we've got Commvault, Rubric, Pure Storage, Cohesity, and Unitrends presenting. It's going to be a fantastic event, so don't miss that one. And with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank all of our presenters today for putting together such great presentations and demos and, and uh, sharing all those insights in the Q&A sessions. So I want to thank Scale Computing and Rubric for making this event possible. And last but of course not least, we'd like to thank all of you for attending today's EcoCast from Actual Tech Media and for all the great questions that really uh, drove this event. So that concludes today's event. Have a great rest of your day.